I am so happy to be here. I, I have been waiting for this moment for over a year to introduce you to a man and to a woman that I've fallen deeply in love with, and I'm so excited that you're going to get to meet them and to hear about Daniel Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine. I want to tell you that it was in October of 2016, before the fall, before <laughs> that day, that I got an email from, in my inbox from Daniel Ellsberg asking to review a book manuscript, to help out with a book manuscript. And I said, oh, what? Me? What, what's this going on? Daniel Ellsberg? Well, it turned out we were going to the same conference at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and he had written virtually to everyone at that conference asking for help on this book. And there were, well, there were 12 of us. It wasn't that big a conference. And <laughs> one of them was Noam Chomsky, and the other was Richard Falk. So, and whatever, it, John Mecklen. It was a tremendous crowd. But not knowing any of that, my husband David and I jumped into Dan's book and we spent the next two months, for October, November, December, three months, uh, going through it with a hair chrome, um, working with Dan on the book. And um, I, it was the only thing to leaven the horrible thing that happened last November. Um, I need to say thank you. There, innumerable thank yous. Um, certainly to Town Hall for all you've done for the community and bringing us here tonight. To the Temple Church, which I remember better for the Temple Daycare Center, where one of our daughters used to go. She's now 43. Um, and I want to thank um, um, the University Bookstore for, for selling Dan's book and helping with the promotion. Um, I particularly want to call out and thank um, Bruce Amundsen and the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, it's true that I founded the organization in 1979, and it's true that I worked like Topsy uh, with the whole nuclear issue until the Berlin Wall came down and until 1991. And then I have to admit that my husband and I kind of took a break, and in 2008, we, I went and played hooky and lived in Costa Rica. Um, I want to thank Bruce for dragging us back and plunging us back into the drama and horror of nuclear war. And um, I want to tell you that the purpose of tonight's meeting, this is really important, is that this is not an ending. This is not just, oh, you can go kiss the Pope's ring, you can meet a historical figure, Daniel Ellsberg, the man who did more than anything to end the Vietnam War. That's true. He is a national hero. But he's not here tonight so you can sit on your butts, kiss his ring, and go home. That's not the point. The point is to go from here out to the lobby, There'll be 32 organizations represented there who are part of our national, uh, our coalition to abolish nuclear weapons. Don't leave here without signing up with at least one affinity group and committing yourself to making this your life purpose. That's what this book is about. That's what this is for. Um, biographies. Anybody with a smartphone can look on the Wikipedia and you can look up, you can, I'm sorry, anybody with smartphone can look up the technical details of um, uh, these two amazing gentlemen, um, Dr. Elberg and Dr. Um, Besner. Um, what I want to tell you in particular, though, about Dr. Besner is that he has a book coming out um, in April called Democracy in Exile. And we're very much hoping that another time that we'll be gathering here will be to celebrate his book coming out. It's about the role of intellectuals in mil military planning and kind of the military industrial academic complex. So I've looked at the preview and it looks really interesting to me. He's a newcomer to our area, so we're delighted to have him. Um, 
And I want to mention one other thing about Dr. Ellsberg, about Dan. I've thought about this a lot. Um, in my mind, the thing that is most singular about Daniel Ellsberg is that he went to hell and played the devil's game. He was a author of nuclear war fighting plans. Now, admittedly, what he was trying to do was to limit or mitigate or put an off switch into mutually assured destruction, but he personally wrote plans for fighting and winning nuclear wars. That was his job. So, in this book, The Doomsday Machine, he tells about a transformation. What changed from being a, a military strategic intellectual who wrote books like or wrote articles on things like the mathematics of blackmail. Look at his technical papers. They're full of differential equations. He's a mathematician. He went from being a cold-blooded military scientist to the passionate, extraordinary man he is today. So my question is, what caused the transformation from going and being in hell to being not really a saint, and I go to Camus, he's not a saint, but he, like the hero in the plague, he strives against pestilences. And that's the best any of us can do. So thank you for giving me this wonderful memory of speaking to a crowd. Thank you for allowing me to present my hero and his noble wife, Patricia, who I, I would like to introduce as well. I'm sure you'll have an extraordinary evening, and please, let's, let's not be strangers. Let's see you again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming, everyone for coming, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Daniel Ellsberg for uh, also joining us here tonight and experiencing the weather that Seattle has to offer. Uh, really appreciate everyone coming out. So I think um, the first thing to start with here, really, is what motivated this book at this time? Why now? Why, after all of these years, come out with a book warning everyone about nuclear war, besides the obvious case of our, our, our commander-in-chief in office right now? Better late than never. Can I say, uh, I really uh, intended as I don't suppose anyone here has actually read any of the book, have they? Can I see hands if anyone has? Okay, just uh, two or three. But it uh, starts off in the introduction by revealing something that was very much of a secret uh, during my trial, and really ever since until then, which is that when I copied the Pentagon Papers in 1969, which were a 47-volume uh, top-secret study called History of U.S. Decision-Making in Vietnam from 1945 to 1968. I copied the 7,000 pages uh, top secret and gave them to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and ultimately to 17 newspapers after four injunctions were brought against them. The Times, the Washington Post, and then two other injunctions uh, to the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Boston Globe, and then they, they stopped trying to enjoin it. But actually, that was in 71. The copying was in 69, and at the same time that I was copying those pages, I was copying everything else in my top secret safe in my office in Rand, things that I, in many cases, uh, was the only one authorized to be seeing them. In fact, that included the Pentagon Papers themselves. But most of what I copied really had to do with my years of work on command and control of nuclear weapons and devising nuclear war plans as a consultant from the Rand Corporation, and then uh, part of the time as an employee of the Defense Department in 64. And my intention was to put that all out after the Pentagon Papers had had their trial, or their trials. Several were scheduled on that, actually. I was put on trial for copying the Pentagon Papers. There was another grand jury going on in Boston at the same time for the distribution of the Pentagon Papers, which I would have been involved in, and which, by the way, did focus on indicting Neil Sheehan and Hedrick Smith and other journalists. Uh, when people say now that no journalist has yet been indicted, that's true, 
but it's not true that they've never thought of indicting a journalist before. Nixon did have that in mind until the peculiar way uh, the, my, my case got ended and the grand jury was dropped. But I thought that after the Pentagon Papers had had what effect they could have in shortening the Vietnam War as of 69 or 71, that if it, then I would put out the material on the, Pen on the nuclear. And just briefly, why that didn't happen then, uh, I'd given it to my brother for safekeeping. He had put all the material I'd given him, he didn't know what it was, especially into a, uh, it was in a cardboard box. He put it in a large green garbage bag and put it in his compost heap. Then he moved it to a trash dump, uh, which was just in time because the neighbors said the FBI were poking that compost heap the next day after he'd moved it with long, flexible rods. So he had it under a green stove in the, in the Terrytown trash heap dump uh, to mark its location in, the, in a bluff on the side of a road. And while I was on trial in 71, and that continued till 73, uh, Tropical Storm Doria came, a small hurricane, and scattered the trash dump all over the landscape. The stove itself was blown apart by about 100 yards, so they couldn't tell where it had been. Uh, the bluff went down the uh, side of the hill, and my brother and a friend of his spent uh, weekends for a year while I was in trial trying to recover that uh, garbage bag. They even hired a backhoe at one point uh, and found a lot of green garbage bags in the trash dump, but none with top secret documents in them. <laughs> I eventually had to give up at about the time when my trial ended in 73, that those documents were unrecoverable. And um, I tell this story now, uh, one reviewer, Graham Ellison, said, why didn't he tell this story 45 years ago? I could think of no reason I would have told this story 45 years ago. It, I always felt it made me look like a schlemiel, basically, of having lost these documents. And we didn't have the documents to show, so there was no, uh, nothing much to be gained by uh, telling that story. And I just tell it in passing now in the book, partly in answer to the question you raised, why now? The fact is that uh, the other part of the answer is I did what I could to uh, transcribe for my lawyers about a 500-page transcript of what I'd worked on in the Pentagon that might come up during the trial. And uh, I used that as a basis for a submission to my publisher at that time, and the editor said, this book would sell 1,400 copies. And I said, well, that's one for every member of Congress. Uh, that's all right, you know. Some other people working on arms control. He said, no, that means we wouldn't publish it. And really, several other times, I've, I've run into the same, same result. And essentially, this time, I just went ahead and decided, well, I'll do it myself if I have to. This book was turned down by 17 publishers on commercial grounds. No one wants to read about nuclear war, period, which uh, I've heard from other people for a long time. In fact, an earlier agent had told me he wouldn't represent me on a book uh, about nuclear weapons, nuclear war. So we'll see. Uh, it is true that uh, I am uh, rewarded now by the presence of Donald Trump in the White House, which has, has focused people on that problem for the first time in many years. So there's a silver lining to anything, uh, even the end of the world here, in terms of sales. I hope you will read the book. That's the point of it, uh, and all of it including something that no one has yet commented on, actually, uh, even in the reviews. I've gotten good reviews, but um, they hardly any have commented on the fact that I really spent a fair amount of time in the last part of the book telling about strategic bombing in World War II, because I've always thought it's not possible to imagine, to believe, to credit the nature of our strategic war planning now, nuclear war planning, without knowing its roots in the firebombing of World War II, about which most Americans know almost nothing. Uh, Any more, uh, this is a prejudicial analogy, but I'll, you'll see, it'll probably come up in the evening. Any more than Japanese know a lot about the rape of Nanjing. They really don't learn it uh, much in their high schools. And uh, very few Americans, uh, in fact, I'll even ask right now, um, how many people here feel that you know when and what was the greatest act of terrorism in human history. And by terrorism, I mean the deliberate killing, massacring of civilians, 
uh, non-combatants or not threatening anybody for a political purpose, killing civilians for a political purpose. What was the largest single night of terrorism in human history? Let me see. Don't be modest. Let me see how many hands. Well, that's almost more than I might have expected. Let me just take one. What was that? What would you say? What? Couldn't hear it. Could you hear it? No, Hiroshima. That's a good guess. Okay, uh, but it's not the case. Hiro Hiroshima and Nagasaki are not, yes? Right. The night of March 9th and 10th, 1945, five months before Hiroshima, 1945, General Curtis LeMay, head of our strategic bombing in the Pacific, used the results of months and years of experimentation with killing civilians by fire, with burning people to death. As it happened, most people will remember Dresden. How many people here have heard of the Dresden massacre? I was in Dresden a couple of years ago. Well, a third, a third here so forth, okay. But Dresden was by far not the largest case of actual burning, of fire burning. Perhaps 38,000 people died in Dresden. Actually, uh, at the time, um, some people put another zero on that, you know, they thought there was more than 100,000, but actually it was 38,000 according to the best records in the city then. On March 9th and 10th, just after Dresden, which was mainly British uh, operation in Dresden, along with US participation on the second day, General Curtis LeMay sent his fire bombers in at low altitude, loaded with incendiary bombs and burned to death between 80 and 120,000 people in one night. And uh, they did not die well. I won't, it, it may even be worth going into a little bit what that means, but there's no question about it. What we did was we brought the ovens to the civilians in their beds or in their shelters, in their homes, and killed about 100,000 people one night. I think had that not been done and then imitated in each of the next 64 cities in population of Japan, where they never got a fire bombing for, killing about 900,000 civilians before Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, Japan. So they say, okay, now that I've said it, have I jogged your memory? How many people now remember having heard of that bombing? Can I see hands? Because it... okay, perhaps twenty. So roughly, yeah. roughly twenty. 30, 40, that's that's part of thirty. Part of our history that the Japanese know pretty well, but uh, we don't. And the fact is that having done that, there really was no decision to be made about Hiroshima in a moral nature or strategic nature. People search for what was the reason, what was the overpowering, overwhelming reason that led people to drop this bomb once it had been developed. And the answer was there was no decision to be made and none was raised. No issue was raised. We did with one bomb what we'd been trying to do, success, sometimes successfully, every night for five months. We'd spent that time killing as many civilians, Japanese, as we could night by night, except they never again got a big firestorm going, which is another story we have to get back to. But that's, as I say, I felt that was quite an important part of the book, and uh, the last part I wrote, and I hope that people read, read that part and don't just skip over it as history. So that leads to a couple of, I think, really interesting questions. Um, the first question is, what do you think it was in, in LeMay, who was obviously uh, General Curtis LeMay, who was a very famous Air Force general who was uh, known for his, um, to be a character, to say the least. What do you think it was the moral switch that allowed the United States to participate in these sorts of fire bombings or trying to engender these sorts of fire bombings? And then um, emerging from that as World War II is often, of course, seen in the American imagination and memory as the good war. And so I'm wondering if you think that it's impossible for there to be moral, strategic bombing. Well, look, people ask right now whether it's possible to have a nuclear war that doesn't violate humanitarian law, international humanitarian law. 
And as the, that's easy to answer in a way, war, not so easy, but a use of nuclear weapons, the U.S. always brings up, or the British brings up, anti-submarine war, where the explosion is under the surface, space war, perhaps air war, uh, high altitude over the Arctic, or something where, not many, or the desert. Now, the desert is not quite so hypothetical. Uh, to have used nuclear weapons, for example, against the trench lines of the Iraqis in 1991 would, would really have threatened very few civilians. It would have been uh, aimed at aggressors in Kuwait, would have killed them, probably been fairly effective in doing that. Um, you know, I'm tempted to give a detail here, and in a way, I, I'm uh, diffident about doing it to anybody at any event, so not over the dinner table. Here we are in church. Well, just this little detail. Uh, I was talk, uh, asked to speak to my children's, uh, my son's uh, school as we approached the Gulf War in 1991. And there had been a lot of publicity that the Iraqis uh, were masters of field fortification, so-called field entrenchment, during the Iran War with Iran, which we had supported both sides, actually. Encouraged Saddam to attack Iran, and then given targeting information to each side against the other, including uh, the materials for poison gas, in some cases. So we'd sort of been uh, deeply involved in that one, even before we sent our troops over. But <coughs> in the Iran-Iraq War. I'd been a Marine uh, platoon leader, infantry platoon leader, and a rifle company commander uh, in peacetime in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. But I, and then I used that uh, training and training I'd given as a battalion operations uh, training officer in Vietnam where I was a civilian. And I walked with troops there, having had this training, knew what I was doing in the field and saw combat up there fairly close. So I had that experience, low-level experience. When I saw the entrenchments that the Iraqis had where they're in their positions in Kuwait, which they had invaded in 1921, which involved field after field of barbed wire trenches, deep slit trenches, very hard to kill people in, in trenches, actually, as they found in World War I. And, uh, but you know, nuclear weapons would do it. Uh, the idea, a Marine's actually, a Marine was going to be sent up north, the coast, against those fortifications. And as a former infantry officer in peacetime, but also who had been in Vietnam, it made my blood run cold to think of how it would be like World War I, you know, that, well, let's go over the top, men, into the barbed wire and against the machine guns and the artillery coming down and just suicidal. And, uh, uh, I, I actually, I, I felt very, very dismayed at the thought that we were going to attack those positions head on. And in fact, what actually happened was that uh, they had planned to do that, but instead, Schwarzkopf devised what they call the Hail uh, Mary maneuver. They moved people very far, uh, flanking the other side, and came on them from the other side. So they didn't make a frontal attack on the end. What just came into my head, because it, it relates to the subject of this evening, I think, a great deal, is this fact. They did have a device for dealing with the troops in the trenches. They bulldozed the trenches with huge bulldozers and they buried the people alive. I mean, they, we, the Americans did that. Now, that was a tactic I had not learned in, in infantry school. Exactly. And as I say, the thought of going, charging, bayonets fixed and so forth, charging those people was blood curdling. But something about, there were even pictures of the arms and legs sticking out of these trenches that had been buried alive by bulldozers. Okay, the subject here is, how do people come to do that or plan to do that? And the answer is, fairly easily, actually. It's something, humans are capable of being heartless, if you like, toward other humans to a degree that we just deny to ourselves. It's a denial. It's, it's not part of our identity that humans act this way in warfare. And not only in warfare, of course, but in warfare in particular. <laughs>
And uh, one way of summing this up, I've, I've said for a long time when we say, this is inhuman, I say no, no other species does this, it's very human. Humane is not a synonym for human and vice versa. Human is not a synonym for humane. And uh, um, it, when I say it ties in with what we're dealing with here is how do people come to make plans for killing, and we haven't really got to this yet, but killing, let's just say, vast numbers of other civilians. And I'm saying historically, Americans have become almost addicted to bombing because we thought of ourselves as having, or I should say the Air Force thinks of itself, as having won a war, Second World War, with bombing. Not Germany, it took troops on the ground to do it in Germany, but uh, in Japan, uh, they feel they won the war, and especially with firebombing. LeMay, you mentioned, we had great misgivings about using the atom bomb at all, as did his boss, Spots, who's his superior in the Pacific, because they could see right away, how do you justify a large air force after the war when you can do the job of 300 bombers with one bomber? And that, that worried them, as a matter of fact. But the idea was, and the Americans didn't quite start that. The first to do it, as I tell in the book, by the way, chronologically, are probably the Japanese in China. And then uh, Guernica. Uh, I was just, <laughs> it's funny, I was doing an interview this morning. I was not supposed to do it, but with uh, an Italian uh, for Repubblica in Italy. And as I uh, found myself talking to them, I mentioned uh, some of this background. I said Guernica, and I put in the little known footnote Italians participated, Mussolini's Air Force participated in Guernica. It wasn't just the German Condor Legion. I wonder how many of their readers would have picked that one up before. But anyway, the, the deliberate destruction, of course, is depicted by Picasso in his uh, painting, Guernica, of the, actually remember, the, what, what is the scene of a bull rearing, you know, in, in fear and anger. And I believe there are sort of limbs, separate limbs that you see in the course of this. Well. The Nazis did it. They did it in the London Blitz, straight terror bombing. But people in the RAF had long been waiting for the ability to use their bombers in just that fashion. And they found the German use of it liberating for them. Uh, as a matter of fact, what, what, yeah. the Liberator bomber, that was a US bomber, I think, right? B-24. But uh, we, they did it immediately then afterwards. They found that for just operational reasons, they couldn't fly during the day. Too many of them shot, got, got shot down on British bombers. They weren't able to fly high enough and have enough, they didn't have enough armament. They were getting shot down. They had to go at night. At night, you couldn't pick out, you were asking now what kind of target, a base or a port or a factory. In practice, our bombers with the Norton bomb site had actually rehearsed in Arizona and Texas, hitting a particular corner of a factory. That's what how precise they thought they were. Well, actually, the British discovered they had to go at night, and going at night, it was hard to find the right town, the right city, but you couldn't take a target meaningfully less than a city, or in particular, the built-up parts of a city. And to get the most effect, you used incendiaries where the uh, wherever it landed, the fire could spread to closely packed housing and so forth. Eventually, the U.S. picked up that tactic for much the same operational reasons. Hard to bomb through clouds, through bad weather, the radar wasn't good enough and so forth. So by the time of Tokyo then, we were, LeMay took on what his superiors wanted, which was fire bombing that would, incend would uh, uh, burn to death as many people as possible. And I used to think, I was four, 14 at that point, uh, that we didn't know they were really doing that. But I was very struck, and it, it's in the book. I, I reproduced the headlines from the first page that were rather astonishing. Uh, not only did Time Magazine at the time say, I remember this phrase, uh, I have it in the book, last night, General Curtis LeMay's firebirds demonstrated that properly kindled, Japanese cities would burn like autumn leaves. Well, the cities, of course, were cities of people. Uh, but even so, I didn't see a number attached to that Japan thing, except that in May, when they went over again, 
they put an overestimate of how many were killed on this second wave of attacks in Tokyo. And the headline in the New York Times, which I wasn't reading then in Detroit, the headline was, one million killed. Now that was a subheading, not a big astonishing thing, just one million killed. And uh, in fact, they didn't describe it in the text till almost the end of the article. No protest, no questions raised in Congress, no nothing. You know, now they, they didn't kill a million on that occasion, anything close to it. But they were able to say that, saying we had become, in a, saying in a certain sense, we had become depraved, simply both the bombers and the people who accepted this. And we talked about Bataan death marks as, uh, did, and in answer to your question again, what was Truman's announcement when he first announced the bomb? Last night we bombed a military base, Hiroshima, a military base. Well, there was a military base in Hiroshima, Hiroshima, but it was at the edge of the town. It was not damaged, it was not targeted. The target was the center of the town. And uh, it was days, I understand, reading the history, before people really understood there was a city associated with that military base. Actually, the city was the target. I'm saying, if you understand this, you can understand how the Air Force went ahead then, uh, building bombers and making plans for the purpose of incinerating many, many, many people. One of the really interesting things that you bring up in the book um, is how these actions, especially during World War II, were justified by arguing either that the, well, not the Nazis in this case, but that the Japanese uh, Imperial Armies were a existential threat to the United States and to Western democracy, and therefore, if we wanted to defeat an enemy, we would have to adopt aspects of terror bombing and um, basically tactics that were understood to be against democratic uh, tradition. But what's so interesting, and, and you, you talk about this in the book, is how this sort of ideology was very neatly assimilated into the logic of the early Cold War. So I was wondering, as someone who, who lived through it and who, who decided to work for the Rand Corporation in the, in the 1950s, um, which was a think tank very much dedicated to fighting the Cold War, why did you, at the time, view the Soviet Union um, as an, an existential threat that was analogous to Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. It makes sense a little bit when you're talking about with Stalin, but Stalin dies in March 53. So how come after March 53, everyone still seems to think that the Soviet Union is Nazi Germany um, uh, reincarnated to mm -hmm. some degree? And this really, I think, is a really critical intellectual underpinning for strategic bombing, for the development of all of these nuclear war plans, and really for the arms race. So I'm curious, one, why did you at that time make that intellectual choice? And then two, what got you out of it? What got you thinking that the Soviets actually aren't bent on, on killing everyone like the Nazis were? Well, I, I presume you realize that uh, when you ask why did you, why did Daniel Ellsberg think this, you're aware Everybody I knew thought that. I mean, this was the, in the air. There but were, Henry Wallace. There were left, everyone I knew, I say, and that included But, but for example, Henry Wallace, the uh, 1940. I, I uh, distributed uh, leaflets for Henry Wallace on 1948 on election day, staying away from the polling places. Uh, and I was uh, strongly backing Henry Wallace because I was very interested in the labor movement. I, I majored in labor economics uh, for the first three years at Harvard with the intention of being either a labor organizer, rather romantically, or a labor economist. I joined the UAW when I was 17, and I worked in the Dodge Hamtramck plant uh, for when I was 17 uh, with that intention. Next year, different kinds of work. And uh, how I got out of that is, is another story, but in part because the labor movement was retrenched in the course of the Cold War. It was kind of swallowed up. Um, the, uh, the Democrats actually this is a bit of esoteric history, and I'm, not, I'm no expert in it, but they pretty much co-opted uh, the labor movement by getting anti-communist uh, labor leaders, like my hero, Walter Ruther of Detroit, uh, against more left-leaning or communist-oriented labor uh, leaders in United Electric and in the faction in the UAW. So, and in effect, 
uh, moved them away from foreign policy, any emphasis that Wallace was involved in. They pretty much deprived Wallace of most of his backing in 48 by red baiting him and saying that only communists uh, would back him. Well, that was not at all true in 47, 48. He was extremely popular. But by the, by the time they'd finished uh, demonizing him, uh, others had dropped away and pretty much communists were his core of support at that point. But <clears throat> I came to believe, by the way, my, that my own brother, who was a very leftist, was ignoring the realities of what was going on in East in Europe at that very time. And I was very impressed by the Berlin blockade. Looking back at it, uh, it's extraordinary to think, well, I'd been 15 when the war ended, uh, was it, let's see, 14, I'm sorry. Um, 14 when the war ended. But during the war, uh, you know, uh, Red Star and uh, wonderful things about the bravery, which was realistic actually on the Eastern Front in Russia, and they, was our, they were our allies, very much so. But it's rather extraordinary to think that three years after the war ended, Americans in, in mass, myself very much included, and I was 17, were determined to stand with the brave Berliners against this uh, tyranny. You know, and they were now our allies, and we were, Curtis LeMay actually, this was the, the best action of his life probably, was in charge of the airlift, which was bringing in even coal, in airplanes for the people of Berlin. Um, the switch was to perceive, as you say, Stalin as uh, a Hitler. And after 49, a Hitler armed with nuclear weapons. But in the Berlin blockade, 48, we had the monopoly of nuclear weapons. We sent, Truman sent, B-29, um, B-29 bombers, known as the atomic bomber, which had dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, sent them over to Britain for the first time with a lot of publicity and LeMay with them, uh, symbolizing, you know, LeMay was the symbol of using nuclear weapons. And we were sending nuclear bombers over there to assure the Russians that if they stopped our air supply, which they could easily do because Berlin was 100 miles inside, or 200, what is it? inside uh, East Germany, uh, their air could have quite in easily harassed and interfered with our air operations. They didn't do that for fear that that would start a nuclear war. By who? By us. Now whether in fact our nuclear threats were critical or not, Truman believed they were. And even General Marshall, who was very stable, admirable person in most respects, came to believe that the nuclear threat had enabled us to keep hold of Berlin as a freedom, as a free city, inside a tyranny in East Europe. Uh, so that the nuclear threat had succeeded in that. And as I'm saying, once you believe that the, uh, the threat has worked, you tend to use it again. But in my case, uh, and everybody's case, it wasn't that hard to imagine that we had another Hitler here, which is what we were hearing. Uh, because there was, it seemed little question, but that the people of East Europe were being held captive, down in effect, against their will. In 1953, there was a significant uprising in East Berlin, uh, actually, which scared the hell out of the, uh, the Russian leaders and led to very great repression. But it was clear, I think, in looking back, and I put it this way in the book, the reality of that was this. Stalin was as ruthless as Hitler, as a matter of fact. In terms of body counts, he probably killed more people than Hitler and killed more communists than Hitler did. And that's not a, a irony or a joke, that was what happened. Uh, we're hearing about Ukraine now and their relations with Russia. Well, Ukraine in the early 30s had been left to starve by the tens of well, millions, but actually what amounted to more than 10 million Absolutely. people to start to. So you couldn't get more ruthless but, than but then Stalin. The, but then the uh, question is... Hitler wasn't. So Stalin dies in 53. Yes, in 53. But the story was, which was quite wrong, uh, wrong. but the story that I never... Here's the other point. I never heard questioned was that the heirs of Stalin were the heirs of a Bolshevik doctrine that Stalin had simply exemplified or was the executive manager of a doctrine, a cold-blooded doctrine for world 
domination and for taking over, and that his heirs were Bolsheviks who were simply as tough, as ruthless, which was not true at all. Uh, why were they holding down all of East Europe uh, other than to take over Europe as a whole, as a base, unless we stop them? Well, there was an answer, and to show now how far denial and how broad denial can be and how deep can be, it isn't that obscure an idea. The Russians had been invaded by Germany twice in the same century. And then there was no issue more critical in their minds, and we knew it, than to keep from being invaded another time from Germany. And not to go through the whole history as I now understand it, but from a, in a perspective entirely different from what I held throughout the Cold War, uh, their motives, let's just put this as a hypothesis, a hypothesis that was not in my mind at that time, that their grip on East Europe was to assure that Germany, if it was going to be rearmed by the West, which it was, would be divided and would confront a buffer, heavy buffer zone uh, before it could do anything to Russia, before they could do anything to Russia again. I have to say, this may sound astonishing, but I just put it to you, the following. I don't think it ever occurred to anybody I knew of to think of the tyranny, and it was a genuine tyranny, of the Russians, the Soviets, in East Europe as being defensive, uh, which they thought of it almost exclusively, rightly or wrongly, as being defensive. That was not in our heads at all. Uh, the differences between thinking whether climate right now is man-made in some degree, you know, the climate changes, or not. And, you know, if you believe one thing, it's almost hard to put yourself in the skin. So, but at least here is an issue where that particular division is in the public domain. People know there's a controversy about it, to say the least. There was no controversy about this at the time. Our elites in the, in the uh, uh, Congress, in the academies, entirely, and in the unions, which were almost had come to be by 48, 49, 50, purged of left-wing elements and were entirely cold warriors. And uh, so everywhere you turned, actually, for advice, you got this idea, we are holding back an expansionist power. And what I was about to say was, the ruthlessness was not exaggerated. The tyranny was not exaggerated. It was a tyrannous dictatorship, not different in that respect from Nazi Germany. But in terms of a willingness to expand at great risk, at suicidal risk and recklessness, not there at all. And yet, that was not even raised as a hypothesis, that there wasn't that difference. So, if I may say, uh, my friend Judith here was, who, by the way, Judith and her husband sitting here, uh, David Barash and Judith Lipton, uh, went over my manuscript so carefully that I really feel I can't be blamed for any remaining errors uh, in this. <laughs> I say in the book, I've always wanted to say that in a, in a book. But it's true in this case. I, mean, I, don't, I don't see how they can, in good conscience, escape responsibility for any remaining errors. But um, uh, one thing, though, that you did say was that I had played the devil's game and that I had made a great change about nuclear weapons. Now, I would always have said, and I would still say right now, my attitudes toward nuclear weapons did not actually change very much in the course of my life. Uh, as I say in the book, and I won't go repeat it here, uh, but I was happened to be uh, in a minority of Americans, and I won't tell the reasons why, who was very dismayed and made very uneasy and anguished by the bomb when I was 14 years old. And I never really changed that attitude, even though later I was working on war plans. Now, how could that be? And the answer is, the same way, and not to give myself airs here, I'm talking about a 14-year-old boy, 20-year-old, uh, to compare myself, let's say, to Leo Zillard, or uh, uh, Rotblat, who later shared the uh, Nobel Peace Prize as representing the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, Joseph Rotblat. They worked on the Manhattan Project because they were sure that they were in a race with, with the Russians, Germans, who had, after all, actually discovered fission, first achieved it and then explained it, uh, Germans. And there was every reason to think that, in a theoretical way at least, they were ahead of us 
in exploring the possibility of a bomb. And so, really, as they, of course, like Zillard in particular, uh, but who, and a number of others, like Rabinowitz, who was, Eugene Rabinowitz, who was the, later the publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, uh, and uh, established the Doomsday Clock under his editorship of the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences. That did not represent a change for him from his working on the bomb during the war, because the purpose during the war was to sure, if possible, that there would be no nuclear war, that the Germans would not have a monopoly of nuclear weapons, which they thought of as an, as an ultimate uh, terror. And in fact, if Germany, and this is just a real speculation on my part, and you're a historian, let me put it to you. If uh, Hitler was not being pressed to military expansion by anyone known to me, I've studied this quite a bit, I don't remember ever reading somebody who was to the right wing of Hitler on this one, more militaristic, certainly not his generals. But he was telling them in 37, in the Hosbach Memorandum, and in 39, his plans for expansion. Now that was not because everybody realized if Germany doesn't expand, you know, they're in deep trouble. No, that was Hitler who got it in part from Albrecht Hosshofer, the geopolitician. What if Hitler had waited? The, the fission is in 1938. The uh, uh, Munich is in 38. But his takeover of Prague, the rest of Czechoslovakia, the beginning of 39. The war, no resistance to that. Because of threats they were making against Prague, straight blackmail. If you don't let us in, uh, Gehrig was saying to Haka, the president of, of Czechoslovakia, uh, our bombers will burn Prague to the ground. Let me assure you, we have laid on very generously on this. Nothing will remain in Prague. And when Hakka finally signed the agreement uh, allowing the Germans to come in to the rest of Czechoslovakia, he said to his foreign minister, our people will curse us forever, but we have saved their lives. He said, okay. So that blackmail actually worked in 38. The war wasn't on 39. The war wasn't on yet. September 1st, 39, he attacks Poland. What if he delayed that until they had the bomb? There was every reason to believe, and if anybody here, we can talk later, but I'd love to hear a contradiction of this if somebody knows better. But to the best of my knowledge, not as an expert, but as somebody who's read a lot about this, uh, the Germans indeed had the best scientists. Uh, they had expelled you know, a whole slew of Jewish scientists, which was very costly to them. Well, it, it, let me take that back. The Jewish scientists didn't win the war in Germany. Hitler didn't uh, suffer from that specifically. The, the Japanese did, you might say, uh, and the rest. But they still had Heisenberg, the uncertainty principle, no better phys nuclear physicist in the world to study this. And the basic inhibition they came up with was, we can't do this in less than four or five years. And Hitler was very impatient, uh, a factor of his, of his character in, what, in, in historical events. And uh, he had, it had to be now, it had to be now. He wanted the war over fast. So he didn't pursue nuclear energy. What if instead they had convinced him that uh, you should delay this for several years till we have the bomb? I think there would be a Nazi Eurasia right now, or at least uh, in Europe. Uh, yeah. I don't think you would ever have gotten it out. It's an interesting counterfactual because I think he was worried about. Uh, it's an interesting counterfactual because. Yeah, Hitler... okay, that's counterfactual. Yeah. But uh, I, was, I was saying, what then followed, uh, since he didn't have it, was that um, we had the monopoly. We were supposed that we were facing somebody who was holding down East Europe the same way Hitler had held down East Europe, pretty much. Okay? Looked very similar there. And the idea that they wanted, uh, that they wanted the West, by the way, there's an analogy very much to something right now. There's a number of analogies right now. Khrushchev did want to get West Berlin under East German control. Absolutely. Why did it matter so much? Well, I was just reading a book about North Korea uh, by a, a Russian uh, expert on Korea, lives, uh, a professor in Seoul named Lankov, the other day. Uh, 
See, South Korea represents an enormous threat to the North Korean regime simply by existing next door to it, speaking the same language, same background, same relatives and everything, and being enormously freer and richer. So that North Korea has to um, nail down every type of communication to keep their people from understanding how big the difference is between North Korea and South Korea. And that uh, they, all the North Koreans know from one way or another that South Koreans have it somewhat better but they don't know, they have no comparison at all to this. Well, it, West Berlin was the same way. West Berlin was a rich, subsidized, very subsidized, but rich, free city in the midst of a tyranny. Why a tyranny? Because Germans, who had invaded Russia twice, didn't really want to be run by Russians or by a communist regime, and they had to be sat on hard uh, to keep them from becoming anti-Russian, anti-Soviet. So that West Berlin represented a threat to the stability of the East German regime. So he wanted to get that. Well, I'm going to come back in, in to analogies now, but which are rife. But the one here is both Korea and Ukraine, some others, which is this. So long as West Berlin persisted 200 miles inside East Germany without any access, it was a danger in part because of defection. People were uh, you know, draining, the, the, the brain drain, they called it, by the tens of thousands into West Berlin and then into West Europe. How do we defend West Berlin? There was one way and one way only to defend West Berlin from being walked into by the Russians, and that was to threaten nuclear war. Well, we did that in 48 with the B-29s. Now, actually, the B-29s we first sent over were not configured for use with atomic bombs. They had to have special bomb bays, special racks. They didn't have those. And we didn't send any nuclear warheads with them, though eventually we did. But that bluff worked. That's when we had a monopoly. Later then, when Khrushchev raises the threat again of basically blockading or simply walking into West Berlin, the threat under Eisenhower and then under Kennedy, under us, was that threatens World War III, meaning what? Meaning, and here I was involved in some of the planning, uh, in a kibitzing role, primarily. It wasn't my main, my main field. But the idea was, well, we send troops in if they try to blockade. If they stop those troops, we send a bigger brigade, you know, to test it. And if they stop those, armed conflict. And what does that mean? There were 22 Soviet armored divisions within that part of Germany. Uh, there was no way in the world we could force our way into Berlin to give them access. And what if they stopped air access this time as well then, so you couldn't hold it by air? We would use tactical nuclear weapons, okay? But by this time, the Russians had hundreds and hundreds of tactical nuclear weapons and medium-range weapons. They could obliterate Europe. This is before they got ICBMs, even, uh, with which she attacked the US. And, uh, but they could wipe out Europe. What we were threatening was a threat of insane action, a threat of, as, as arose in Vietnam, destroying the village in order to save it, literally sacrificing Europe in order to keep Berlin from being occupied. Now, that's a threat of an insane action. And it's tempting to say it's an insane policy. And actually, I will say that now. But at the time, you could also say, no, it's a threat of an insane action, of a suicidal, homicidal action. And it can work. And it did work. And nothing else would have worked. So that's where we were then. Now we move up, to, however, I would say, to have threatened essentially what we then thought of not as nuclear winner, not of homicide, we didn't know that was in the cards yet, but we did know total annihilation of Eurasia, Europe and Asia, and within a few years, the US as well. Okay, that's the threat, blow the place up. And it, it worked. I would say insane, immoral, uh, to prepare that, to rely on that. But what's the alternative? 
The alternative was to find some other way of uh, providing for the security of Europe to the extent it was needed. For example, you could transport every Berliner into West Germany, and you could take every black, you could take every brick of Berlin if you wanted, and move it out on an airlift, or simply rebuild it outside Europe for a fraction of the cost we were spending on the ability to destroy life in the Northern Hemisphere in order to do that. But that was not even raised as a possibility. We just make the threat. Now, move up to what's happening right now. North Korea feels that we intend regime change. They're right. Regime change has been in the minds of the White House, Democrat and Republican, for a generation here. We exercise invasion annually of North Korea with South Korean forces, and we're doing it last month, exercising the invasion of North Korea. We exercise and prepare for, and we deploy special forces units openly described as meant to assassinate Kim Jong-un and, quote, decapitate the regime. But this little fat, little rocket man has this paranoid fantasy that he might be under some threat from the U.S. just because we do stuff like that. Uh, it just, he's, you know, what can you do with him? So he feels that he needs a deterrent against this attack, which we are constantly exercising. And he has, for reasons I won't go through all the history, but he acquired now nuclear weapons. But they only have the range to annihilate South Korea and large parts of Japan. Well, you might say, that should be pretty deterrent. It would deter me. Except that we have Lindsey Graham, now the confidant of the president, who has now said repeatedly on television that in course of golfing conversations on weekends at Mar-a-Lago with President Trump, he said, he has said face to face to me, and I agree with him, remember, the casualties will all be over there. Repeat, he said, thousands and thousands will die, but they won't be over there. They won't be over here. Okay? Now, statements like that in the press give Kim Jong-un the feeling that his deterrent isn't fully adequate. Uh, against this administration, and that he must have the ability to kill Americans as well. I lived through an analogy to this that is exact. Uh, Khrushchev found that he was going to lose the one ally that he had in the world, Cuba, that had not become communist through Soviet troops going into it. They had even a sentimental attachment to Cuba, and uh, for that reason, they reminded them of their revolutionary past and their fathers. Uh, they loved Che Guevara, but also they would be blamed by China for losing Cuba and not being able to do anything about it. But at that time, <clears throat> if we had gone into Cuba, they could have walked into Berlin. And Kennedy had that very much in his mind. If we invade Cuba as he was exercising during 1962, the biggest exercises we had done since World War II against a mythical uh, dictator named Ortsak. Castro spelled backwards, as, as Khrushchev noticed. And Castro said, I used to play a game like that when I was a kid, yes. Backwards spelling of names. So we were exercising uh, invasion of Castro. So Khrushchev, feeling that his evident ability to annihilate Europe was not a sufficient deterrent, decided to put missiles in range of the US by sending them to Cuba. And uh, by the way, no Americans to speak of outside the CIA in the White House and a handful in the Pentagon were aware that we were preparing invasion plans and were attempting to assassinate Castro with the help of the mafia under both Eisenhower and Kennedy, and to some degree under Johnson later. So we didn't know that, but they knew that. So they were responding to that in a faith. Um, and we're looking right now at a country, Kim Jong-un, that is faced with what is no longer covert, absolutely open in intentions and efforts to overthrow them. Now, 
How much can you sympathize with North Korea? A tyrannous, murderous regime, a dictatorship, closed, couldn't be worse, particularly. Expansionist, a threat to the United States? How so? And uh, is it possible that they could do without uh, ICBMs and H-bombs? Uh, people who know the story of North Korea, not me, but I read people, Van Kovner said, yes, they are open to negotiating no longer missile tests or warhead tests. At least there's every reason, and the Chinese and Russian propose just that, that that could do it. They then would not have a threat to the U.S. directly. They can, by the way, just put a warhead on a boat and send it over here very easily, and they've always been able to do that. So when uh, Lindsey Graham says the casualties will all be over there, he's not quite right. We would go. Los Angeles would go. Los Angeles, Long Beach Harbor would go probably from a boat. Not in 30 days, not in 30 minutes, but in 30 days. But as if now they're trying to get ICBMs. The idea of getting them to give up ICBMs and H-bombs is said by everyone who knows anything about Korea to be very possible and worth doing. To get them to give up their existing fission atom bombs, which they regard as the only deterrent to the death of Kim Jong-un and his regime, is not feasible. And Trump is saying that as a condition of negotiations right now, which is not possible. Kim thinks he would be crazy to give up those weapons. And that's not the kind of crazy he is. The kind he is crazy, it seems, is that he thinks that if it comes to war, the important thing is to get in the first blow, give the other side a severe bloody nose, and cause them to back off. That's the only way you can, you can do it. You can't win in the end over, he can't defeat the United States, but he could cause them by hitting their local bases and whatnot to say, oh, this is costing too much, let's make terms. That's crazy. And it's the nature of NATO planning for 40 years, pretty much the same plans we had. And today's news is, in the Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere, behind a paywall, but somebody gave me a copy, um, that our plans that we're now considering under H.R. McMaster, the uh, Special Security Advisor, is, quote, to give the North Koreans a bloody nose, to show them that we are determined, uh, we really do want them to give up their nuclear weapons, and to show it, we hit their missile sites, we hit command and control, we do something else. The chance of that actually ending hostilities is as close to zero as anything could be. Uh, nothing is quite zero, come to that, but that's very close to zero. That's not going to happen. Both sides, in other words, are under the crazy impression that it's better for them to go first than second. And if they're convinced that war is coming, or in Trump's case, that it's the only way of getting rid of their nuclear weapons, he might do it. And actually, he's not wrong about this. There is no other way, no other military solution. Let me quote uh, one of my favorite authorities, Stephen Bannon, who has been saying throughout, before he was fired, there is no military solution in Korea, one of the reasons he was fired. Well, when he's right, he's right. Uh, it's possible to be both crazy and smart in the same head. And in fact, it happens all the time. And So uh, uh, Trump, on the other hand, if he really believes that he can, or H.R. McMaster, he can give the North Koreans a bloody nose and it will stop there, it's crazy. And, okay, the theme of my book uh, is, was expressed in an earlier form of the title, A Chronicle of Madness, that the nuclear epoch has been one in which very widely leaderships in, in both sides have entertained, have believed, have held crazy beliefs as to what was possible, what was necessary, and what was justified. And they've been allowed to do that to a large extent. Uh, just as uh, Republicans, let's say, will uh, go along now with the idea that there is no man-made climate change. And say, 
We were, Patricia and I were flying up here tonight and looking out, and I was thinking, thank God this isn't New York we're flying into uh, right now. So they're able to uh, live through what's happening in New York right now and in Boston and say, no, no, no climate change. Well, likewise, our military planning for nuclear war has been based on the idea sort of, well, if we have to carry this out, here's how we'll do it. You know? And it's different ways of planning near extinction of the human species. And on that happy note, uh, I think it's time for some questions. Yep. <laughs> The Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility will be convening a follow-up conversation about tonight's event here in the church on Wednesday, January 24th. If you don't get your question answered or come away from tonight with many more questions and want community around that, you can pick up information on the WPSR table in the lobby. But for now, we have time for a few questions. So, sir, your first question. Last night, Rachel Maddow talked about Mike Gravel and how you gave him information to get, try to get the Pentagon Papers released. Today, Dianne Feinstein released the papers. I'm curious of your observation about how history seems to be repeating itself and what, you, what insight you can give us about what's happening. I think I've uh, thrown up a, a number of clues in effect to my feelings about the extent to which history was repeating itself, which is unhappily uh, over and over in, uh, as, as we see things right now. For example, uh, something I don't deal with in the book enough uh, was something that really only became clear uh, a year or two ago for the first time, which was that 1983 was one of the most, was perhaps uh, the most dangerous part, comparable to the Cuban Missile Crisis 20 years earlier. And we didn't even know that, and the reason was that the then Soviet leader, former KGB head, Andropov, had become convinced that the US, Reagan, was planning a first strike against the Soviet Union. Now, Reagan was not. That was absolutely wrong. But what could have given that clue, that idea? How could such an, Reagan himself was astonished when he was finally convinced by a defector that Andropov really had feared that, uh, and that his reaction, his actions in part were in response to that fear. How could he have imagined that? Well. Reagan was conducting the largest, fastest buildup of nuclear arms since John F. Kennedy. Uh, we're now involved in the third such buildup now. But Reagan's was a trillion dollar buildup uh, like that. Second, Reagan, to put the Soviets off guard, was doing exercises off the Soviet coast and sending reconnaissance planes even into Soviet airspace, testing their defenses as if preparing for an invasion. This was very secret. Almost nobody in the government knew that he was doing that when they saw Russian reactions such as the shoot down of KAL 007, the Korean airliner. Hardly anybody realized that that followed actions of penetration that had been happening and that they confused that with a military reconnaissance plane at that time. Uh, third, we had a, a, a president who regarded the Soviet Union as an evil empire, as he said openly, um, and uh, one that should be uh, eliminated, essentially. He even joked at a microphone on one occasion, which he didn't realize was an open microphone, and he was just testing beforehand, and he said, uh, the, the Soviet Union has been banned, the bombing will begin in 15 minutes. Uh, and so forth, showing a sort of same mind and forth, uh, the, uh, uh, Reagan was batting down the idea of a nuclear weapons freeze, of <laughs> the kind of freeze word that's come out recently in connection with North Korea, stopping exercises on our part, stopping testing on their part. Well, the idea of a bilateral nuclear weapons freeze with no more nuclear weapons, which I was a big part of, uh, was, had to be batted down by Reagan, very, very hard. He was putting first strike weapons like Pershing II into East Germany with an ability to hit Moscow within minutes. And finally, this just came out within the last year, after, uh, almost you know, 30 years later, that they had gotten from a defector, from a spy, a very super secret, higher than top secret, uh, 
plan in NATO for the decapitation of Soviet command and control, which, did, did you know this or have you followed this? Which scared the hell out of them. Uh, and uh, as I say, this only became available in the last year, that they had this plan for cyber warfare, basically, and for hitting various command and control points, which looked exactly like a first strike plan that we might think might work. So here we had gotten Andropov uh, into thinking that we were preparing to use an exercise, which was a nuclear weapons exercise in Europe called Able Archer, who would be the cover for an actual surprise attack. And he had a huge intelligence thing going on. Up to this point, A, it's exactly like the present, both with respect to Russia and North Korea. And B, one little factor in here, Andropov, the KGB former chairman, and now, uh, uh, now uh, the Prime Minister, the President, believed that Reagan was crazy. And he wasn't the only one who thought that, actually, uh, to remind people at the time. And just a little footnote right now, it's, it's in the news this week, more, that Reagan was showing evidence of Alzheimer's in the White House, and, and which, of course, later uh, became very evident. But he regarded him as crazy. It's, we have an open discussion going right now of whether we have a crazy president or not, or whether he's only pretending to be crazy, and whether that makes a difference, all of that. All of it leading up to the notion that they fear that this person might actually launch a surprise attack, okay? All that is similar. And now, what no one who's commented on this crisis, I take it you've, you've studied it, the Able Archer and so forth, nobody comments on the fact that Andropov's readiness to respond to that was to preempt the attack. To move first. Go second first. Don't wait for the first one to go. Don't do like Barbarossa in World War II where, uh, where Hitler's uh, armies uh, captured uh, millions and millions of Russians with a surprise attack. No, go first in a nuclear era. But that's insane. That's insane. Go first, the world ends when you go first. When, as of when? When did we learn that? 1983. That's the year of Abel Archer. In that year, Carl Sagan and the others came out with the, the news for the first time that the smoke from burning cities would be lofted into the stratosphere by firestorms. And here we were asking whether history repeats itself. In World War II, we were only able to get firestorms going three times, mainly, though there were two other rather very small firestorms at Hamburg, Dresden, and Tokyo. And a firestorm is a very special kind of a fire. Very simul you have to have simultaneous fires over a long, a widespread uh, area, which create uh, updrafts from low pressure zones then in the, the heated air rises and bring in winds either in a rolling conflagration across if there's a ground wind or from all sides, creating temperatures now that are of enormously high, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, 1200 degrees in some cases, 1500 in others. Temperatures you don't get under any other conditions except a nuclear weapon. Hiroshima created a firestorm, but nothing between Tokyo on March 9th and 10th and Hiroshima on August 6th created a firestorm. That's why they only killed 900,000 people, of whom 100,000 were on one night, because that was the firestorm. It, it lost, now what they discovered was, in 1983, the smoke from the burning city will be lofted by the firestorm force of these up, updrafts into the stratosphere where it doesn't rain out. And it goes around the globe very quickly, obstructing sunlight for what we now know is more than a decade. Perhaps 70% of sunlight would be obstructed. This is assuming many cities, hundreds of cities being hit simultaneously, which would happen in our plans or Russian plans. Okay, the harvests would all be destroyed. They would be aborted, they would be ended. Uh, there would be no harvest, very little vegetation left, and nearly everyone would starve on Earth. Nuclear winter, 
uh, not only a matter of the lakes freezing and the rivers freezing and terrible cold and drought and whatnot, but the death of the harvest would mean that the world food supplies of about 60 days would be over, uh, it wouldn't be, it would take uh, longer than 60 days for the U.S. because a lot of it is concentrated here. So we wouldn't export it anymore. So the people who rely on exports of U.S. food or Chinese soybeans, whatnot, they starve first. We starve later, within a year. Now, that is what was be, uh, that's what's being threatened now by uh, any initiation of nuclear war. That was discovered in 83, but Russian scientists, Stenchikov and some of the others, had discovered it a little before ours did, 82, 81. Gorbachev referred to this. So Andropov, plan of preempting the attack, was, was, he, was he crazy? No one ever said Andropov was crazy, but this was a crazy plan. It was exactly like ours all this time. And the idea of preempting. Right now on North Korea, nuclear winter is not at stake. Of nine nuclear states, only one cannot blot out enough sunlight to starve at least two billion people. The Indians and Pakistanis can do that. The others can do more. North Korea, whether it has 20 or 30 or 60 weapons, can't cause nuclear winter. And they don't have enough cities there for us to loft that much smoke. But what would be involved is the death of several million people, more in one day or a week than has ever been seen in the history of the world. See, the biggest, number one, is Tokyo, 100,000, 80 to 120,000. This would be several million within a day or a week. So bigger, bigger than ever, but not nuclear winter. Andropov, however, but not a good idea for North Korea. If North Korea thinks it's a good idea to uh, uh, start a war with the United States, wrong. They're, that would be wrong. On the other hand, if he has made provision to assure nuclear response to his being killed, Kim Jong-un, that's like every other ruler pretty much uh, on this, you know. Hitler himself, Hitler was willing to see Germany burned to the ground if he was going to get killed. I would say that ideas of decapitating Kim Jong-un are as reckless and murderous and, you know, as they could be. But come back to Andropov. Andropov was not Donald J. Trump. Uh, and yet, his plans were to preempt. And, and here's what I put to you, Dan. I haven't seen anyone comment on that. No one. He said, and by the way, this plan, because it's so familiar. It's a SAC plan, a strategic air command. That's what we would do with the same effect. Exactly. So we are building now another trillion dollars, perhaps $1.6 trillion, uh, in allowing for inflation in the next 30 years, for weapons to do exactly this, to preempt an attack with this effect. Right? So uh, I'm saying that it's a, it's a craziness altogether, and in answer to your question, does history repeat itself? It hardly changes. <laughs> it just goes on. Okay. So, um, Dan, I have a one-sentence question about the increasing automation of military operations and warfare. By the way, uh, Peter Lumsdane from the Ground Zero Jeep Action in Nevada back in the 80s on the Vandenberg MX campaign. So my question is, how do you think that the rapidly accelerating rise of corporate military robotics and artificial in intelligence affects the challenges and resistance strategies for the human race in this century? Uh, there is talk now of um, automating drone warfare almost entirely, you know, under automatic intelligence. Under Obama, the rules of engagement were raised for the drones at, at one point, and I think it was under uh, Petraeus in particular in Afghanistan, uh, to allow drones to attack anyone who fitted certain profiles of uh, movement or of communications and various things. Uh, they didn't have to be any intelligence specifying them. They didn't have to be wearing, carrying special weapons or uniforms or anything else. But if they acted in a certain way, if they communicated in a certain way, hellfire missiles, 
come down and hit wedding party after wedding party after wedding party and funeral parties. And then when people come out to the funerals of the people who've been kidding before, they get hit too because they're a convocation of vehicles in the desert. What are, you know, what are they doing all together like that anyway? So uh, this is uh, horrible, but that's what happens. Well, you can automate that pretty easily. You know, If you have a set of criteria uh, for launching the criterion, that's all it takes. In fact, at one point they said any male between, what was it, 14 and 40, something like that, is to be, what? Any combatants, enemy combatants. Well, uh, a computer can figure that one out. You know, I mean, uh, facial recognition isn't, isn't too great, but uh, uh, it's good enough for that, basically. So you can automate that. Uh, the, in the book, I, I quote, going back now into the 50s, uh, General Cooter, who was at one, had various jobs, but at one point he was head of North American Air Defense Command, at other times Pacific Air Command, uh, was saying that Herb York, who was then the director of research and engineering, or I th no, no, I think at that time he was still director of Livermore Lab, uh, later under Kennedy was uh, research and engineering. So he tells that if you, they were just starting on ABM uh, work then, and he said, uh, anti-ballistic missile, and he said, you know, the, the timing is so fast there, the missiles are coming over, you can't wait for human decision. You know, you've got to uh, automate this link and this link and so forth. And Herb York was sort of going along with this up to a point. And then he said, of course, eventually we get it to the point where it's entirely computerized. And York says, you know, they'll recognize it, they'll go against it. And remember, one of the things always in their mind on uh, use of nuclear weapons was, in the air, there's no problem. That's not quite true if you happen to be underneath where the explosions are happening. Uh, but in general, it's up in the air, it's in space. You can relatively delegate it, you know. And actually, North American uh, Air Defense Command was the first to be delegated the authority to use nuclear weapons without the president uh, doing it in the mid-50s. Okay, so Kuda says, but eventually we'll get it so it's totally automated. And York says, oh no, we're never gonna do that. And he reports, Cooter looked at him and said, well, we might as well surrender right now then. And uh, so the answer then on in, uh, AI and artificial intelligence, I believe is there are many people who do not shrink from the idea of a Terminator type uh, warfare, you know, world in which uh, the computers are waging war uh, with us underneath, essentially, you know, it happening or, or in the midst. Yes, this, this does have to change. Since I've mentioned York, I want to mention one other thing. York, who I came to know late in, life, late in his life, uh, had once gone back to Livermore Lab, the second nuclear design lab. There are two major nuclear design labs, both of them campuses of the University of California. All of our nuclear weapons, from the atom bomb, uh, first ones, fat man, little man, to the neutron bomb, to everything else, have all been designed at an American university. One university, <laughs> the University of California. Now, the status, the relationship has changed a little bit, in part because they, in administrative uh, problems they were having about security and whatnot. But anyway, York went back to Livermore and said, I've asked myself, how many weapons it takes to deter someone rational enough to be deterred? How many does it take? So what would you say? Any candidates here? I'm hearing one. One? Well, that's what York said, one. Uh, he said one, but maybe you'd say you needed a few more, you know, in case they thought they could get the one, or one city they might be willing to sacrifice, something like that. Maybe 10. And then he went at it from another point of view. Uh, he said, what's the largest amount of destruction you would want one man, one person, one woman, to be able to inflict in a brief period of time? Is there some ceiling on that? Or is there, or is there a too much? And uh, he said, how about the total casualties of World War II, 60 million? Uh, maybe the ability to kill 60 million people in a week or so should be the limit for what somebody can control. He says, well, that would take about 100 weapons. 
100 kiloton weapons. He said, uh, you could calculate, uh, it might get up to 200, uh, but not, probably not. It would be 100 or less. So he said, the number needed to deter nuclear attack, which, by the way, Judith, is where I started. You know, How do we deter this attack? The number needed would be, quote, 1 to 10 to 100, but closer to 1 than 100. He says, OK. That would mean, by the way, 49. If, so, if North Korea has 60, which they probably don't, it's probably less, that's more than you could justify on this ground. Every other nuclear weapon state has many more than that. When Eisenhower came into office in 1953, we had 1,000 fission weapons, the type that destroyed Nagasaki, only most of them more powerful by that time than Nagasaki. But fission weapons, 1,000 that Truman left. When Eisenhower left office, we had 23,000, mostly thermonuclear weapons. The earlier thermonuclear weapons used Nagasaki weapons, need Nagasaki weapons as their detonator, as their percussion cap, as their uh, fuse, you might say. Uh, the early, earliest of our H-bombs, it's easier to make a big one than a small one, actually, were a thousand times more powerful than the Nagasaki. So we had 23,000 of those. Eventually, in 1967, under, under Johnson, see, I was in Vietnam in 67. In 67, we had 37,000 nuclear weapons. The Russians had uh, over th close to 40,000 at that point. Too. At, the, at the height, there was a total in the world of about 67,000 nuclear weapons. Come back to Herb York's point. One to 10 to 100 and closer to one than 100. Uh, is it desirable to keep North Korea from getting an H-bomb and an ICBM? Yes. It was also desirable that Pakistan not get them and that, each, and that uh, India not get them, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, all of the others, in effect. Uh, would that be the end of the world? Or is there any reason to believe, by the way, that, no, that uh, North Korea would use those weapons against the U.S. out of the blue, unprovoked? Actually, no reason. Is it impossible? No, I wouldn't say it was impossible. He could have a false alarm. He could uh, go crazy, something like that. It's definitely desirable he not have them. Are there ways of keeping him from getting them other than attacking? Probably yes, according to the people who know North Korea best. You'd have to have a peace treaty with North Korea after the, we don't have one since the Korean War. You'd have to uh, lower or drop the sanctions. You'd have to stop exercising uh, assassination and invasion. Those things, that doesn't seem impossible demands somehow. Well, that means we give up regime change. How can you give up regime change just because they're another country uh, and aren't, you know, not a state of the United States? Well. Since Iraq, we've talked about regime change, which is the definition of empire. Uh, a country that believes that it has the right and the power and the readiness and the intention to determine who rules another country. And we are, in fact, a covert empire, in my opinion. Covert in the sense of plausible denial, meaning the fact that we are an empire, that we have this determination to decide who runs this country and that country is covert, we deny it plausibly. Our people, why plausibly? Well, our people are educated to think, well, that's not us, that's not who we are. Actually, it is who we are, but, but we deny that. It's, uh, and, um, yeah. uh, well, he said, uh, uh, and moreover, the means are covert, assassination, bribery, uh, paramilitary, coups, and whatnot. Uh, so it's a denied uh, empire, pretty much. If we gave that up, we would have a chance of keeping, a good chance of keeping North Korea from not moving ahead with ICBMs. That would be good. The military alternative is the almost certain death of several million people, mostly over there, our allies, mostly South Korea and Japan. And 
So, so we are running very, very long, but, um, and I said that that would be the last question, but folks in the line rightly pointed out one final question, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, if you could very briefly, if you could very briefly before we go, um, give this audience advice on what they can do as citizens to respond to the information you have presented to us tonight. I would say the current situation calls for, um, the highest degree of, uh, one can imagine, I, I can't imagine what would be too much non-violently and truthfully to do, to convey to Congress, but above all to the executive branch, there must not be an attack on North Korea. They sh that should be heard in letters to the editor, it be heard in town hall meetings like this. Thank you for raising the question. I apologize for not raising it earlier. And I think uh, Judith and uh, David are going to raise this uh, uh, more about the discussion of what to do. But I would put it the highest priority, avoiding a war with North Korea. Um, and uh, keep in touch with that in a way you couldn't do years ago. But now uh, it's possible on the internet to find out a tremendous amount is leaking out, to be sure, to the, uh, to the rage of, uh, of uh, Trump. Uh, I can certainly say, by the way, that if someone in the administration there, there must be hundreds of people, thousands of people, who have access to estimates in the administration that officially tell that not all the casualties would be over there and that the casualties over there are absolutely intolerable. That's not the word that would be used officially. They would just say millions. And, would say, and by the way, it's not only that the effects of this war would not only be measured in um, casualties in my opinion, and let me take one minute on that because I believe we are in a crisis right now. Uh, not unlike the Cuban Missile Crisis or the 83 crisis, except in the scale. We're not looking at the end of the world. By the way, when I say that San Francisco may go as a result of this, it's not the end of the world, but you know, it's, it's, it's what it is. It's uh, horrible, horrible. But beyond the casualties, if there is an attack on this country in retaliation, which I would think is not certain, but highly likely. Democracy is pretty much over in this country, I think. This country becomes one large airline, airport terminal security area, total surveillance, ID cards, going through metal detectors everywhere you turn around. Um, Martial law, to a large extent, I'm talking about assuming that there is an attack, let's say, on a city from a weapon in a container, in a container freight from North Korea as a result of this. Uh, otherwise, in the world, I think non-proliferation is over, non-proliferation is over, proliferation is on, essentially, once it becomes clear that nuclear weapons are used and usable on both sides, despite the horrible effects. You say, well, the effects are horrible, but better to have them than not have them. So Japan and others, uh, uh, South Korea, Iran, you know, South Korea is pretty much gone, actually, at this point. India and Pakistan get H-bombs instead of A-bombs. Testing resumes with almost certainty. I have not seen this in print anywhere. Said, Have you seen anybody say that? Well, I'll just put it to you from my experience. After that war, uh, in which is testing, you know, they'll be looking at all the measurements. The first two-sided nuclear war ever. We're right now making the first threats against a nuclear weapon state that have ever been made since the Cuban Missile Crisis 55 years ago. So I think testing resumes. India and Pakistan moved from having fission bombs, Nagasaki-type bombs, to H-bombs. And the difference that makes is that if they have a war, and they've come close to it several times in the last 20 years, over Kashmir, over Kashmir, now they would starve because of the effect on sunlight one to two billion people, one third of the Earth's population. With H-bombs, their nuclear winter control, seven billion, they can do everything. That's not a good change. Uh, the idea of moving away from our current hair-triggered doomsday machines, I think is essentially over for, not just for my lifetime, which isn't that long, but uh, for as long as you can see, for a long time. 
It'll have to be a very different world generations from now to move away from the doomsday machines after the war, which is being told we are considering it, we are preparing it, we're ready to do it, and this and that, uh, daily, like today. So there should be committees of correspondence, there should be town, town hall meetings, as there were, for instance, there were meetings with legislators when they come back, Republican and Democrat, as there were when uh, the issue arose of war with Syria uh, over the gas attack in Syria. And it was the um, American public, not really particularly triggered by activists, as far as I'm aware, that told their legislators, what was this, 2013, we don't want another Middle Eastern war now. And there is a case, by the way, where in Syria is a horrible situation, Assad, a murderous tyrant, and where I think that U.S. intervention could only have made matters worse, even worse, than they actually were. So we managed to get out of that with the help of uh, Putin, actually, and, uh, and Barack Obama. The ultimate thing, though, going beyond this crisis, which is right now, this month, next month, uh, is, I would say, a necessary element is we need a new Congress. There has to be a Democratic House and or Senate, and it has to be different Democrats from the ones we've seen for the last 10 years. That, that, that hardly gets us anywhere. But with Democrats who are different from the ones we've seen in this, I think then the possibility for investigation for raising all the issues that I raised, for allowing the public to be heard on this, it becomes possible. And it's not only bad things that happen as surprises. Uh, I've lived long enough to have seen several secular miracles. Uh, and one of them is the downfall of the Berlin Wall, the ending of the Warsaw Pact that we were talking about earlier, uh, followed, not necessarily, but followed by the U.S. incorporating that in, and moving first use threats right up to the border of Russia and Poland. Okay, then there was Nelson Mandela came to power. No one foresaw that. So no one can say it's impossible to change this. Uh, is it likely that the military industrial people who make money out of keeping these doomsday machines on alert on both sides? Russia now has a profit motive when they build this stuff, in addition to the bureaucratic motives, just as we do. There is essentially no other motive for keeping our intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are nothing but uh, lightning rods for attack, essentially. So to reproduce those is reproducing a doomsday machine without any justifiable rationale. That can be, it's not impossible, it will be very difficult to change that but it's not impossible, and that's what we must do. Daniel Ellsberg, <laughs> Professor Daniel Besner, thank you so much for being here. I'm sorry that went so long, but this is a very powerful and important conversation. One more plug for that follow-up conversation here at the church, hosted by WPSR on January 24th, where concrete activist opportunities will be discussed. More information in the lobby. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>